Thank you for joining us at Community On Demand. Today's message is presented by Dr. Kenny Hodges. Kenny holds a Master of Divinity from Dallas Theological Seminary and a Doctor of Ministries from Grace School of Theology. These days, many folks are confused about just what it means to be saved. Kenny will take us through Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31, and explain just what it means to be saved by faith alone, in Christ alone. This message was recorded during a live Sunday morning service at Community. Let's listen in as Kenny begins. Well, good morning. Good morning. Question for you. How many of you grew up in church? How many of you came to Christ later in life? And Okay. I'm going to be talking to, to everybody today, but I grew up in small town Mississippi. Emphasis on small town. First Baptist Church. Now, uh... I had a group of friends. We, First Baptist Church was on Church Street. You had the First Baptist across the street. You had the Prez. Across the other corner, you had the Methodist Church. Down the street, you had the Episcopal Church. And kind of as a stepchild, a few, few streets over, you had the Catholic Church. They didn't make Church Street for some reason. I don't know why. But we all were taught certain things as kids. Being Southern Baptist, I was taught... Once saved, you're always saved. My Methodist buddies, and we were all good friends, a small town, they said, oh, no, 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 the Bible says you can fall from grace. And we would have our high school and, and junior high school theological discussions. We knew nothing about what we were talking about. But the preacher said it. So their preacher said you could lose your salvation. My preacher said you couldn't. The Presbyterian one was kind of a mixture of all of that, you know. If you're one of the elect, you can't lose it, but can't be sure you're one of the elect. But anyway, it was confusing. Well, what I want to do today is go through 10 verses, although we're going to look at some parallel verses in Hebrews toward the end. <clears throat> and I hope to show you from Paul's Epistle to Romans, chapter 3, that justification is truly by... Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. So, if you think about the book of Romans, the theme is stated in Romans 1.8. By the way, turn to Romans chapter 3, but we can back up to 1.8. 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation. To everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. In other words, it starts with faith, it ends with faith. As it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Literally, it says the righteous man by faith shall live. <clears throat> now, it's interesting, the word salvation there in verse 16. Do you know, we're, we're fixing to, fixing to, that's a good Mississippi term, we're about to, you know, we're going to, fixing to, we're about to uh, jump into salvation, but we're going to look at it in the sense of justification. But Romans doesn't use this word salvation again until you get to chapter 5. And yet chapters 3 and 4 in the first part of 5 deal with the, one of the clearest passages that tell us how to know we are Righteous, how to know we have eternal life. Uh, that's because salvation occurs in different phases. Now, the book of Romans, I think the best way to outline it is to think about the righteousness of God because that word occurs over and over. So the theme then is the gospel's power both to justify us, save us, and to deliver us, save us, to experience life. Now, remember, when we talk about salvation, we always think of, think of it in three phases. In justification, which is what we're going to be talking about this morning, we're saved from the penalty of sin. The word we use for Christian life is sanctification, where we're saved from the power of sin. One day we'll be glorified. We'll be saved from the very presence of sin. So when you see the word salvation in the New Testament, you always ask the question, what am I being saved from? When Peter was drowning and he said, Lord, save me. 
He wasn't talking about going to heaven. He didn't want to die. So the context tells us. So justification, we're going to see this morning, happens the moment we believe and we are declared righteous in God's courtroom. Sanctification happens over the course of our lives. The biggest part of our Christian life is in this phase two called sanctification. We're becoming more and more righteous, hopefully. And finally, one day, at the, when the Lord comes back or when we die, we will be righteous. We'll no longer have our old sin nature and we'll be our righteousness that's imputed to our account will become reality. Now, if we're going to outline Romans, I would do it this way. Righteousness revealed in condemnation. The first three chapters tell us that the religious man, the heathen, the Jew, everybody is guilty before God. And then we're going to look at the first part this morning of righteousness revealed in justification. And then Romans 6, 7, and 8 tell us how to live the Christian life. Romans 9, 10, 11 deal with Israel. What about Israel? Has God given up his covenant people? No. Romans 11 says the gift and calling of God are irrevocable. There's still a plan for Israel. And then, nine, and then 12 and following, righteousness revealed in transformed living. And we're going to jump in on just that second part today. And we're going to start in verse 20 of Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> now, Gabe, there, you have an outline. All of this, this, I'm going to be shooting a lot of stuff at you today. <laughs> I grew up, my daddy left me an octagon barrel Marlin 22 that I used to squirrel hunt with. He had to be a pretty good shot to hit a squirrel with a 22. So I usually take my 410, you know, pattern bird shot. You're getting bird shot today. I'm throwing a lot on the wall, and I hope some of it will stick. So I'm going to go kind of quickly. It's only 10 verses, but a lot to say. So we've just seen, finished the first three chapters declaring the whole world guilty and in verse 20, it says, because by the works of the law, and literally it just says there by works of law, he may be talking about the Jewish law, but there's no definite article. Any, any works-based system, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law principle comes the knowledge of sin. Now, God gave us the law, or he didn't give he gave Israel the law, his covenant people, as a means of fellowship. Do this and live. Don't do this, you'll be cursed. Had nothing to do with their eternal life and their being uh, what we would call saved or justified. That's always been by faith. But the law was given for fellowship. But the law is like a perfect mirror that we look into that shows us our shortcomings. Galatians says it this way. The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. But in verse 21, Paul says, but now. Now, he uses that expression many times in his writing. It's always a contrast. It's, got, it's going to introduce something to us new, and in this case, something very wonderful. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So, again, it's apart from the law principle, but it's manifested and it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, one well-known commentator of old, I'm going to trip over this, but I'm not careful, said it's an astounding fact which no man of his own accord would have thought even possible that righteousness is to be had by sinners wholly apart from anything like law, the Mosaic law or any other code such as human ethics presents. Mankind wants to make themselves righteous. God says that doesn't work. Now, when we talk about the righteousness of God in verse 21, we're not talking about God's righteous character, or we're not talking about righteous living, which there are a number of men in the Bible who said they were righteous men. That doesn't mean perfect. We're talking about an attribute of God, not an attribute of God, but a status of righteousness that God gives Two sinners when they believe in Jesus Christ. In other words, righteousness is put to our account. That's because when we believe in Jesus, we are placed in him. And he is righteous. And so God sees us in his righteousness. Now, the word manifest means simply to, to be visible or make known or show, to be realized, to be thoroughly understood. And so Paul is wanting us to see this. 
Now, to be witnessed by the law and the prophets, the law, for example, would be the sacrificial system. We're going to look at that in Hebrews in a moment. We're going to go there and see how this pictured what Christ did on the cross in, verse 20, in verses 24 and 25 of this chapter. The prophets would be, for example, Isaiah 53, where the suffering servant is presented, the one who's crushed for our iniquities, all a picture of God's righteousness being revealed in his son. And then in verse 32, it says, even, I mean, 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus, in Jesus Christ for all who believe because there is no distinction. Now understand, this is going to sound funny, but we're not saved by faith in and of itself. You can have all the faith in the world in your good works, and that will not save you. It is always the object of your faith that saves. So faith is not a work. Uh, some people would say, well, they want to redefine faith uh, to be like a cop. You know, commitment, obedience, and perseverance. But faith is simply receiving something that's offered. One well-known theologian said it this way, Bear assent to the gospel, divorced from a transforming commitment to the living Christ is by biblical standards less than faith and less than saving and would be to secure only false conversions. Now hear carefully what he's saying. He's saying to believe and, and put out your hand and receive the gift that's offered of eternal life Receive righteousness from God by faith alone, in Christ alone, by his grace alone. That's dangerous. You've got to commit. You've got to, we call this front-loading the gospel. Now, nowhere in the Bible do you find Jesus ever telling anybody, clean up your life, stop doing this, whatever, and then I will save you. As a matter of fact, the woman at the well is a perfect example. Messed up life completely. What, five husbands living with a man? And Jesus said, if, hey, if, if, if you knew what I offered, I'd give you living water, and I'd give it to you freely. And he did. I like, <clears throat> who is this guy, Dave Anderson? What does he know? <laughs> he says, such faith is not, we're accused that we, we, we're talking about intellectual con assent. You know, I, I believe it, but it doesn't mean anything. He says, such faith is not casual, detached. Intellectual process and conclusion, it's an act of trust whereby one puts full weight of his sins on the cross of Christ to open the gates of heaven. Saving faith needs to be tethered to the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's always the object of our faith. And he goes on to say, for there is no distinction in other words, just as there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile concerning their sin, there's no distinction between them regarding how they receive salvation. Everyone is justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. And then a Bible verse that we all quote, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Why would that come right there? We've just been talking about falling short of God's glory and sinning. Well, it's because... Everyone believes the same way because everyone is in the same boat. We've all sinned. We all fall short. Now, to fall short the, to, is simply to sin means to miss the mark in the Bible. It would be as if I had a dartboard or I painted a, hung a dartboard right here and everybody stood at the back door and everybody had to hit that bullseye perfectly. Now, some of you might accidentally do that once or twice, but you'd have to do it every time over and over over and never miss. But the truth is, we fall short much worse than that. It would be like standing in downtown Houston and trying to throw a dart all the way to the woodlands and hit that. Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteousnesses, the best we can do, are as filthy rags. And so we need a righteousness from God. So Paul is simply telling us, look, it doesn't matter if you're man, woman, Jew, Greek, heathen, everybody falls short. But God has a remedy to that. Notice verse 24. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in 
Christ Jesus. That, to me, that 24 and 25 are two of the most exciting verses in the Bible to me. Because it tells us how we're saved. See, to be justified is to be declared, declared righteous. Justification is a legal term. On the one hand, it means to acquit. But on the other hand, it means to declare righteous. Now, it's not a change in our character, but it's a change in our relationship. It's a courtroom term. Being justified as a gift by His grace, Thomas Constable says, describes a person's status in the sight of the law, not the condition of her character. The conditions of one's character and conduct is what that which deals with with which sanctification deals. You see, we get mixed up. We think that because if I tell somebody they're justified, they're declared righteous, then they're going to be righteous and live a holy life. Not necessarily. Now, one of my favorite cartoon characters is Snuffy Smith. I can, being from Mississippi, he's what my mama would call Poe White trash. You know, he's a chicken thief. That's his, how he makes his living. And he's in the courtroom before the judge. And by the way, the judge and the sheriff are just about as crooked as Snuffy is. But the judge says, not guilty. Free to go. Well, go on, Smith. Go home. The sheriff says, that's never happened before, judge. I think he's in shock. Free to go. He was guilty of sin. But he was declared not guilty in the courtroom. Now, that's a picture of what God does. We are justified as a gift. had not to do anything whether we're guilty or not. We are guilty. He just told us we've all sinned. It's by His grace, and it's because of the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Now, gift means freely or undeservedly. Now, I was going to illustrate today. I was going to give somebody the keys to a brand new car today. I didn't get by the parking. Yeah, I thought about McKenzie, actually. And uh, I was going to have him come up here and say, do you believe I have a brand new car sitting in the parking lot? But I didn't get by Walmart to buy the car, so. You would have been disappointed at the little toy car. But it's, it, if I had told you, though, McKenzie, you can have this car if you promise to come to my house every other week and do the dishes and mop the floors, and mow my yard. You probably would have for the car, but, but that's not a gift. A gift has no strings attached, either before or after. Now, he says it's through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, again, I like the former founder of Dallas Seminary. Lewis Perry says, Redemption is an act of God by which he himself, in his son, pays as a ransom the price of human sin, which the outraged holiness and government of God requires. Now, redemption in the Bible is seen in a group of words. One group has the idea of redeeming or liberating by the payment of ransom. One has the idea of agarazo, to purchase in the market. The other one has a little prefix in front of it, which has the idea of purchase out of the market. Now, we see that first word, agarazo, used that even false teachers were redeemed. There's a sense in which the blood of Christ redeemed the world. But it's when we believe that we are purchased out of that market and we are liberated and set loose. Redemption is a wonderful doctrine. And I've got so much to do here, I don't have time to to do much on that. But just understand, when Christ redeemed us, he paid the price that was required. He paid for sin completely. Christ's ransom price was sufficient for all mankind Provisionally available to all, but the liberation has been effectual for those who believe. It's like money in the bank. It's done. It's done for the world. And yet, you have to put your faith in Christ to withdraw it. That's one way it's illustrated. And then verse 25, whom God displayed publicly. Now, hang on to that publicly part. We're going to come back to that. As a propitiation. Now, that's not a word we throw around a lot. It only occurs... Six times in the New Testament in English translation. And there are three main word groups that, all from the same root, that have this idea. And it means satisfaction or satisfactory sacrifice. 
But these words differ a little bit. One of them is elaskamai, and that's used in Luke and Hebrews 2.17. And it's, the idea is the removal of guilt. But the two that I want us to look at today are the word elasmas, which you'll be familiar with in John, 1 John 2.2. 2. And the idea in this word is the satisfactory sacrifice. Remember 1 John 2.2? 2. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours, but the sins of the whole world. Jesus is the satisfactory sacrifice. He appeased God's wrath. That's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. 1 John 4.10, This is love, not that we love God, but He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, the satisfactory sacrifice. But there's another word, <clears throat> excuse me, helasterion, which means literally the place of satisfaction. The emphasis is more on not the sacrifice, but where the sacrifice occurs. And that's the word that's used here in Romans 3.25. Now, to understand that correctly, we need to go to the book of Hebrews for just a minute and look at a few verses. Because in Hebrews, that word is not translated Propitiation. So turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 9. And because context is king, I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go back to chapter 7, verse 1. He starts talking about Melchizedek. If you don't know anything about this guy named Melchizedek, the Bible tells us he was a priest to God before the Levitical or Aaron's priesthood was ever set up. But... Hebrews chapter 7 verse 11 says, If perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, and not to be designated among the sons of the order of Aaron? Well, there was a need for another. And so you skip down to 14. It's evident that our Lord descended from Judah a tribe with no reference to which Moses spoke concerning priest. And it's clear still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, then who has become not on the basis of law, but according to the power of an indestructible life. Skip to verse 22. So much more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. So you see what's happening here in Hebrews. The Old Testament, the law, the sacrificial system... It's being superseded now by a new priest in the person of Jesus. And notice what it says in 23 of Hebrews 7. Former priests, they existed in great numbers. They were prevented by death from continuing. But he, Jesus on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Hence, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Verse 27, he's exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to daily offer like the old high priest did for his own sins and the sins of others because he did this. Here's the word I want you to see. Once for all when he offered himself up. That little phrase, once for all, is going to happen over and over and over through these passages. And I'm not going to do them all. Uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. This is where I want to show you the propitiation, the same word that's used in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Romans 9 starts talking about the earthly priesthood, 9 1. The first covenant have regulations of divine worship and earthly sanctuary. There's a tabernacle, the outer one, which was a lampstand, the table, sacred bread called the holy place. Behind the second, there was a tabernacle, which is called tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies, having a golden jar of incense, the ark of the covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding manna, Aaron's rod, which budded, tables of the covenant. You see all this ritualistic law stuff, and above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. Now, did you see the word propitiation? Well, if you didn't, it's because it's not translated propitiation. It's translated mercy seat. 
But that's exactly the same word that's used in Romans 325. Now, when I went to Israel with Dr. Anderson about, I think this is 2012, there was a tabernacle in the wilderness, or, and we got to go through, and part of what you got to do was see what the Holy of Holies would look like. This is not the real Holy of Holies, or I would be dead, but this is what a picture. But the mercy seat was the, the place between the anointing cherubim where the blood was sprinkled by the priest over and over and over again. Now, in verse 7 of Hebrews 9 says, Into this second place, the, the Holy of Holies, the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. So you get it. Year after year after year after year after year, you repeat. But only one man. It was not a public propitiation. It was private only the high priest could go into the presence of God. Now he goes on and talks about this is a symbol of the present time. Verse 11, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, not of this creation, not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. There's that redemption we talked about. He entered the holy place, once for all. There's that phrase again. Having obtained eternal redemption. Now, skip on down to verse 25 of chapter 9. Now, it was not that he should offer himself often as the high priest does. You see this contrast. Ritualistic, over and over, high priest, year after year, doesn't pay for sin, covers sin. That's what atonement means. Otherwise, Jesus would have to have suffered from the foundation of the world. But now, again, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Insomuch as it is appointed for men once to die, after this comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once, Hope you see this once, once for all, once, once for all happening over and over. Once to bear the sins of many shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await for him. Now I like the footnote that Dr. Charles Ryrie has in his Bible. He says, apart from the sin question, and it means that in his first coming Christ dealt with sin once for all. In his second coming, he will take redeemed sinners to himself at the consummation of their salvation. So here's that phase three salvation. Remember, saved from the penalty of sin, that's justification. Christian life being saved from the power of sin. Here we will be saved from the very presence of sin when he appears and takes us to himself. Now, I've got to get back to Romans or we'll never get out of here. So we were almost done, but... But just a couple of verses in chapter 10. They're so good. Verse 10, verse 10. By his will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. High priest, they do it over and over. Verse 12. But he offered one sacrifice for sins for all time. He sat down at the right hand of God. Now, when Jesus sits down by the right hand of God, that means it's finished. That's John 19, it is finished. Waiting for that time until his enemies be made a footstool. For the offering he has perfected, by one offering he has perfected, for all time, those who are sanctified. Do you get the picture that the writer of Hebrews is telling us? That Jesus died as our great high priest. Once for all, his blood was shed once for all. And that has benefits that last forever. Now, what's the significance, though, of propitiation in Romans 3, 23 and and the mercy seat in Hebrews 9, 5? Well, it says God displayed publicly in verse 25 of Romans Romans 3 a propitiation. When When was Jesus displayed publicly as a propitiation? When he hung on the cross. You see, the propitiation of the Old Testament was private. Only the high priest could come in. 
But when Jesus said it is finished, what happened? The, the temple veil, remember, rent from top to bottom. Hands of God took it and went, <laughs> signifying that the place access to God is now no longer private. It's offered freely because of what Christ did publicly, propitiating God, paying for our sins with his blood. In Exodus 25, the, concerning the place of propitiation, it says, There I will meet with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark. I will speak to you about that which I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. So what's the significance? John 2.2 2 and 4.10, Jesus is the sacrifice. Hebrews 9.5 tells us about the mercy seat, but Romans 5.25 tells us Jesus is the mercy seat. So he's both the propitiatory sacrifice and the place of meeting between God. As the sacrifice, he paid for the sins of the world. You can't get away from that in 1 John 2.2. 2. Not our sins only, but the sins of the world. The sins of the world have been paid for. But he becomes our mercy seat, our meeting place between us and God when we put our faith in him. And God justifies us. He declares us righteous. Now, we just looked at all these verses in, Rome, in the Hebrews. But he says he does this to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Now, I'm about to go real fast through the rest of these slides because they back up what I've just said, but we're running short on time. So God doesn't compromise his standards. He cannot just say, he's not like the judge in Snuffy Smith that judges saying, I need to go fishing, not guilty. God could never do that because of his righteousness. It's because of the sacrifice of his son that he can declare a, purchase, a person righteous and not guilty. Now, the sins previously committed would be every sin that has ever been committed up to the time Christ died on the cross. Our sins were paid for on credit, if you will. I think that's why the word atonement is used in the Old Testament, because the word means covering. It's used of a black pitch that they put on the side of a boat to, to cover. Do you know that the word atonement's never used in the New Testament? Go look it up. I don't think, and I, I know we say theologically that Christ's substitutionary atonement. I understand that. But Christ didn't cover sins. He paid for them once for all. Divine love triumphed over divine wrath by divine self-sacrifice. I love this quote. God took his own loving initiative to appease his own righteous anger by bearing it in his own self, in his son, when he took our place and died for us. The demonstration of his righteousness. God's character is always consistent. Jesus' death demonstrated God's righteous standards. Sin was paid for as justice demanded. And now he can be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Because sin was paid for as God's justice demanded, he's able to declare sinners righteous when they put their faith in his son. You know, I've told people sometimes that I know I'm going to heaven when I die, and they say, well, isn't that arrogant? It's arrogant? That's the epitome of humility because I don't have anything to do with it. It's all what Jesus did. Now, we've looked at justification, and very quickly in these last two or three verses, verses 21 through 26 shows what faith alone in Christ alone includes. And by the way, plug for Ichthus Camp. I brought this up here as a visual aid. There's Ichthus. This is the only camp I know of that's built on this slogan. Eternal life by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. You need your kids to go to camp. They will learn the gospel. Verses 27 through 31 show us what faith alone in Christ excludes. Paul asks five rhetorical questions, and I'm going to do them quickly. First one, question one, where is boasting? He says, where is boasting? It's excluded. By what kind of law? A law of works? No, by a law of faith. What kind of law? Faith. Because we're justified by faith alone. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. 
Question three, is he a God of Jews only? No is the expected answer. He's a God of Jews, he's a God of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith are one. So is he also not the God of the Gentiles? Question four, yes. Why? Because he's one. He doesn't have two ways of salvation. Salvation is always by faith alone, Christ alone. Now, notice he justifies the circumcision. This is the covenant people, the Jews, by faith, the uncircumcised through faith. Now, I'm not absolutely sure why he uses two different prepositions, but the one by faith refers to more origin of source. Well, the Jews had all of that. They were just trusting in a false source for God's acceptance. They had tried to depend on law. Gentiles didn't have any of that. But both of them are justified through faith, the means of salvation. And then finally, in verse 31, it's our final verse. Do we nullify the law, or not, not the, just do we nullify the law principle through faith? Heaven forbid, may it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Why? Because faith establishes the true purpose of the law. The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. The law was never intended to justify a person in the sense of giving them God's righteousness. We see this all throughout Romans. Shall we sin because we're under the law but not under grace? Heaven, no. No, no, no. Is the law sin? Chapter 7, no, it's perfect. It's just the perfect mirror that shows us who we are. The law is holy and commandment is holy and righteous and good. So the answer of this is that righteousness has always been by faith, not law. Israel as a nation moved from the faith principle to the law principle because they misunderstood righteousness by faith. I'm going to close with a couple of verses, and I promise these are the last two. Romans chapter 9, verse 30 through 33. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? They did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion the stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, he who believes in him will not be disappointed. My heart's desire and my prayer for them is their salvation. I bear them witness. They've got a zeal for God, but not in accordance to knowledge. Now, I would say today in the church, there are a lot of people who got a zeal for God, but they mess the gospel up. It's not in according to knowledge. For knowing about God, not knowing about God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Where are you today? Have you been trusting a system that says, you know, my righteousnesses, my good works, all that. If I, if I promise God stuff that I'll do things, then he'll let me go to heaven. He'll justify me. Now, all our righteousness is filthy rags. We could never meet God's standards. That's why Jesus died on the cross. We saw it to pay for sin. He, God displayed him publicly, propitiation in his blood. We also saw that he paid for all sin. Once for all, he's coming back without reference to sin. That still doesn't save us. What we must do is receive his offer of life. Receive the righteousness that he offers by faith in the person of of Jesus Christ. Faith's not a work. It's a, just a response to what God has done. When we do that, we are born into God's family, and God imputes his righteousness to our account. Now, there's a part two of this message, and hopefully won't be quite as long as part one was. <laughs> in a, in a week, couple of weeks, we're going to look at Romans chapter four, because this imputed righteousness is what Romans four is about. And then we'll wrap up with just two verses in or three verses in chapter 5 where Paul pulls it all together. But if you're here today and you don't know you have eternal life, or you've ever questioned whether you were 
God's child. Notice, understand, it's not about you. You have nothing you can boast in. If you've accepted Christ, if you've received him, if you've put your faith in him, you've believed in him, you're his forever because it's his finished work on the cross that saves you. Not anything you have done, you are doing, or you will do can ever separate you from his love. On behalf of Pastor Dan and the folks at Community, thank you for joining us today at Community On Demand. Feel free to share this link with others, and please know you are always welcome to be our guest during a live service any Sunday morning at our campus in the Woodlands, Texas. For more information, just click on the link, www.cbcwoodlands.org. I hope you will again join us at Community On Demand.